Roundup-resistant genetically modified crops. Our government has just approved next generation, Monsanto's next generation of herbicide-tolerant GMOs. According to EcoWatch.com, last week the U.S. Department of Agriculture approved the sale and planting of dicamba-tolerant cotton and soybeans. Cornell University study found that exposure to the herbicide dicamba can cause serious health issues like shortness of breath, muscle weakness, and changes in the human central nervous system. However, thanks to the USDA, we may soon be exposed to 88 times more dicamba on soybeans and 14 times more on cotton. And the latest genetic modification will likely mean a future of dicamba-resistant weeds, just like the weeds that have become resistant to Roundup. Does it really take a rocket scientist to see how this is going to end? If we keep allowing Monsanto to introduce these herbicide-resistant GMOs, weeds will become more resistant, and we will be exposing ourselves to more potent and powerful and prevalent chemicals. We have to stop this dangerous cycle before it's too late. If you find yourself posting lots of selfies on social media, science says you may be a narcissist. A recent study from The Ohio State University examined 800 men between the ages of 18 and 40. After the participants answered questionnaires about their behavior and social media activity, researchers were able to determine the link between posting pictures of yourself and narcissistic behavior. The lead author of the study, Jesse Fox, said, It's not surprising that men who post a lot of selfies and spend more time editing them are narcissistic, but this is the first time it has actually been confirmed in a study. Posting the occasional self-portrait is normal, but posting a constant stream of selfies might be a sign of mental illness. Or it may just be a sign that some of us are spending way too much time with smartphones and computers. And finally, if you've been priced out of the market for today's electric vehicles, Chevy may have a plan for your next car purchase. General Motors has released their new plan, Bolt, which is their concept electric car designed for attainability, not exclusivity. In other words, the Bolt may soon be Chevy's electric vehicle for the masses. The new vehicle will also have the ability to self-park once the driver is out of the car and let us use an app to direct the car to return and pick us up at the same location. The Bolt will have a 200-mile extended range that should give buyers comfort about being stranded, and it will compete with Tesla's Model 3, which will have a similar price tag. At $30,000, the Bolt and the Model 3 are still somewhat pricey, but they're thousands cheaper than current electric models, and they will help more Americans make the switch to green vehicles. Mary Barra, the new chief executive of General Motors, said Chevrolet believes electrification is a pillar of future transportation and needs to be affordable for a wider segment of customers. Just like Nissan's electric Leaf and Tesla's Model 3, the Bolt will put electric vehicles into the hands of millions more Americans and help our nation take a big step toward a cleaner, greener future. And that's the way it is for the week of January 19, 2015. I'm Tom Hartman on Science and Green News. Sarah Brosley Ugly, the good. Jeremy Scahill, during, appearance, during an appearance on CNN Sunday, the Intercept co-founder called out the mainstream media for giving a platform to people who profit from fear-mongering about terrorism. Take a look. Where I think it gets into really kind of fear-generating territory is when you have these so-called terror analysts on the air, many of whom also work for risk consultancy firms that benefit from the idea of making us afraid. Um, I don't think that CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News do anywhere near a good enough job at revealing the co potential conflicts of interest of some of the on-air analysts who also work in the private sector and make money off of the idea that we should be very afraid. Well, you understand? Well said, Jeremy. It's good to see that someone out there is keeping the corporate media accountable. The bad. Dinesh D'Souza, a conservative commentator, is drawing ridicule this week for comparing himself to Martin Luther King Jr. on Twitter. D'Souza, who pled guilty to campaign fraud earlier last year, said, An interesting parallel. MLK was targeted by J. Edgar Hoover, an unsavory character. I was targeted by the equally unsavory B. Hussein Obama. Unbelievable. 
I think it's safe to say that Dinesh brought the right-wing persecution complex to a new low with that gem of a tweet. And the very, very ugly C.B. Emery Jr. The Kentucky state senator is under fire for proposing one of the most mean-spirited and hateful bills in recent memory. Emory's bill, the so-called Kentucky Student Privacy Act, would essentially ban schools from recognizing transgender students and would require all students to be registered as either male or female according to their biological sex. But that's not even the worst part. Emory's bill would also allow a student who comes across a transgender person in a bathroom that doesn't reflect their biological sex to sue and win up to $2,500 from their school. That's what America's transgender youth needs, right? A, a bounty system that rewards their humiliation. That is very, very ugly. That's insanely ugly. So, anyway, State of the Union, helicopter parents, um, you know, uh, and, and there's a lot of other things in the news that we could talk about as you'd like. Joe in Garrettsville, Ohio. Hey, Joe, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Good. Um, I was just calling in uh, to talk about the State of the Union, but real quick on the uh, the whole, uh, um, what did you call it, helicopter mom? Yeah, the whatever. bubble wrap uh, bubble wrap children, helicopter yeah, yeah, parenting. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, parenting has a lot to do with it, but, you know, I've noticed, too, um, just with, you know, all the technology that's taken you know, over over the last, you know, 10, 12, 15 years or so. Um, kids don't want to go outside as much. Ah, because you know, they want to stay home and play video games yeah. or, or yeah, the... They uh, want to chat. Yeah, they, this world's smaller than it used to be, I feel, for them. Yeah. That was for me. They're Facebooking and Twittering like and... You know? Yeah, yeah. They, it's, a, they, it's just strength the world. You know, you can talk to somebody, you know, in China, you know, instantly. Yeah. You know? But that's a very different thing from the experience of face-to-face -face interaction, getting out in the world, having to how, having to work out the interpersonal dynamics of you know, okay, where do we go? How do we make decisions? What are we going to do this afternoon? Who gets to decide? I mean, there's there's just well, a lot of what makes the parents bubble wrap because they feel like they have to do it, you know? Right. So yeah, know, you're right. Kind of you're right. Just thinking about that, but in going going into the. Uh, uh, State of the Union. One thing I haven't really heard, like I, I love the ideas. Um, my wife and I both work. We make around fifty grand a year, and to get a tax break would be great. Um, and you know, I, I didn't hear anything about infrastructure, which I think is a huge thing. Yeah, uh, he's but, he's suggesting an infrastructure fund, okay, and because great. Congress won't appropriate the money, he wants to mm -hmm. float bonds, which is basically like treasuries. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like the war bonds, you know, uh, during World War Two. Yeah, yeah. And and I I think all these are like really good ideas. You know, it's you know it's progressive or whatever you want to call it. It makes things better for the country as a whole. But right. like, which is why the Republicans taxes, will oppose it. Looking, yeah, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> the point I'm going to make. Is like like even when the Democrats were in control, both houses they were on they, they couldn't get they couldn't even get the government to run sometimes. You well, know? the Democrats so, actually only had seventy two or seventy four legislative days where they were actually in control of both houses. Because, uh, first of all, the first couple of weeks of Obama's first term, maybe it was the first couple of months, it was some time there, uh, before Al Franken got sworn in, he did not, President Obama did not have the ability to, to uh, overcome a filibuster. All right, so the Senate was under the control of the Republicans. They started filibustering everything. Al Franken finally gets in, and 74 days later, Ted Kennedy dies. And so there goes your majority. And then Ted Kennedy gets replaced by Scott Brown, uh, you know, who's part of the filibuster machine. So out of the last six years, the Democrats had 74 days. And when you look at the things that they got done, I mean, uh, the middle class, the largest middle class tax cut in history, saving Chrysler, saving GM, turning 800,000 monthly job losses into monthly job gains, increasing education spending, decreasing student loan costs, strengthening hate crime laws. I've got this on a card here. I've got a whole list of these things. Uh, they expanded CHIPS, the Children's Health Insurance Program. The child labor laws were enforced. Wall Street was reformed. Credit card reform. Uh, predatory lending to soldiers was restricted. Uh, the, the troops got paid for stop-loss time. He stopped torture. He increased VA spending. Uh, put women on submarines. Equal pay for women. Nuclear arms reduction and disposal. BP agreed to pay $20 billion bucks. EPA was strengthened. 9-11 health care funding. Don't ask, don't tell was repealed. And Obamacare happened in 74 days. That's pretty spectacular, actually. No, and, that, and, I, and I agree. Like, there's a lot of things that have gotten done. But I'm saying, like, moving forward, 
now that you have a Republican majority in both that, I don't even like I don't even know how any of those things get done. Like, right? Yeah, like, they don't, they don't even get to the floor. So, okay, we're not conservative anymore. Or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just don't. I, I like the ideas. I, I think they're great. I just don't understand how they're going to go into action. I guess. Well, we'll see. I mean, I, I think that at at some point the Republican Party. And I think that Mitt Romney coming out and saying he's concerned about people on welfare, he's concerned about poor people, uh, you know, over this last weekend when he was at that Republican uh, retreat or whatever it was. I think that that's a sign that the Republican Party is having that Harry Truman moment. And you've got the clip, Shano, in there someplace. I don't know if you can easily find it or not. But Harry Truman famously said, and he said it in many different venues and many different times, but he would say, you know, every four years, the Republicans start behaving like Democrats just long enough to get elected, and then they go back to behaving like Republicans. And so we may be at that point where the Republicans, if they're going to put a, quote, middle-of-the-road candidate up, a Mitt Romney, a Chris Christie, a Jeb Bush, who I consider all to be flaming, screaming, crazed right-wingers, but still, they're not as crazy as Ted Cruz, they're not as crazy as, as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, Rand Paul, for example. If, if the Republican Party is going to put up their, their so-called moderates, they're going to have to have some legislative accomplishments to point to for that. And so maybe they'll go along with some of this stuff. And I think Obama's trying to craft these things in a way that the more rational Republicans will actually support them. I mean, he's, he's, got, uh, he's got a couple of Republicans on board with a couple of these things. So we'll see. We'll see. Joe, I got to move along. Thanks a lot for the call. Matt in East Jordan, Michigan. Hey, Matt. Yeah, good uh, Good morning, Tom. No, I guess good afternoon. I thought I'd relate my uh, childhood story to you just to show how greatly things have changed and, and, and how think what would be considered acceptable in okay. the past and unacceptable now. My parents were big-time right-wingers, and... NRA members, my dad built a bomb shelter in the backyard. And, uh, he claimed to have friends that were Omega-7. I know he had some, some of these Cubans that ran away actually got elected into uh, positions where, we, where I grew up. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the reason I tell you this is because, because reflecting their ideas, the day that John Kennedy got shot, I announced to our public elementary school that I thought it was a good thing, which led Whoa. to me actually getting expelled from kindergarten. Whoa. And the upshot of that was my parents got really angry at the public school, and they started sending me to a Lutheran private school for several years. Right. And what that necessitated, the Lutheran public school, this is in San Diego, downtown San Diego, was some 30 miles away. So I had to walk uh, about three miles each morning down to catch the city bus. I made three city transfers, or three or four, uh, and then, uh, of course, it was three miles back in the afternoon, My training, my dad, and I think my mom once, they took me once on the buses to do this, and I did this for years. And this is when you were, like, under 10 years old? Well, how old were you in kindergarten? Five or six? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is when you were six years old. kindergarten, Tom. Yeah. Amazing. No big deal. By the time I got to be eight, I mean, I was a veteran at this. Yeah. We moved out of the county, and we went to a different school, but... They didn't think anything of it, and I had, fortunately, I never had any bad experiences. I didn't think anything of it myself either, being young like that, other than I was tired from the walk in the evening, you know? Yeah. And, of course, even even there in San Diego, where you got long days, I mean, it was practically dark year-round when I got home. Right. And, it's a, you know, I mean, San Diego's not like Detroit or, or whatnot, but it's a big city. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they didn't think anything of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, this is, I'm, I'm wondering when this started because we've had people call who, who grew up in the 60s and the 70s, in the 80s and in the 90s who are all saying, well, you know, that wasn't my experience. And it's been 14 years now since 9-11. I'm wondering if 9-11, you know, if this is part of our national post-traumatic stress disorder from the, from the horrible way that Bush handled 9-11. By, by basically just pounding us all with fear. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I'm just thinking out loud, but like, I, I would be really interesting to hear from somebody who was not a bubble wrap child in, say, 99 or 2000 or 2001. Uh, you know, but we'll see. Matt, thanks a lot for the call. Um, when, when did this helicopter parenting really kick in? I don't know. You're listening to Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. But whenever it did kick in, I don't think it's a good thing for kids. I just, I just don't. 